This is Book TV's Afterwards. This week, we go back into our archives for a discussion with Tara Westover on her book, Educated. She'll be interviewed by author and journalist Savannah Cahalan. I am so happy and thrilled to be here with you today for your book, Educated. Um, I have to tell you that I was, I, this is one of the most extraordinary memoirs that I've ever read. Uh, so I am honored to be here with you today to oh, talk wow. to you about it. Thank I really, I, I was blown away by this. And, and actually, reading it for a second time actually even made my experience with it even that more profound. So thank you so much. You're it's welcome. really great to be here. So I wanted to just dive right in. Mm -hmm. And what I want to do is ask you to read a bit from the preface. Mm -hmm. So I'll let you take that. Turning toward our house on the hillside, I see movements of a different kind, tall shadows stiffly pushing through the currents. My brothers are awake, testing the weather. I imagine my mother at the stove, hovering over bran pancakes. I picture my father hunched by the back door, lacing his steel-toed boots and threading his calloused hands into welding gloves. On the highway below, the school bus rose, rolls past without stopping. I am only seven but I understand that it is this fact more than any other that makes my family different. We don't go to school. Dad worries that the government will force us to go, but it can't because it doesn't know about us. Four of my parents' seven children don't have birth certificates. We have no medical records because we were born at home and have never seen a doctor or nurse. We have no school records because we've never set foot in a classroom. When I am nine, I will be issued a delayed certificate of birth but at this moment, according to the state of Idaho and the federal government, I do not exist. Of course, I did exist. I had grown up preparing for the days of abomination, watching for the sun to darken, for the moon to drip as if with blood. I spent my summers bottling peaches and my winters rotating supplies. When the world of men failed, my family would continue on unaffected. Well, that is quite an opening. And I, I want to start there. I want to start... Um, in Bucks Peak, Idaho, where this takes place, where your childhood took place. Can you tell me a little bit, um, you touch on some of it, but take me through a day in the life of what it was like as a 10-year-old a version of yourself on um, Bucks Peak. Well, we had a farm, which belonged to my grandfather, so it was really beautiful. There were a lot of wild wheat fields, and then it was at the base of this mountain, and so Bucks Peak is the name of the mountain. And it was this, it wasn't a particularly big mountain, but it was just really beautifully made. You know, it sort of came up out of the earth and, and, and formed into a really perfect spire. And I'd always been told this beautiful story about the mountain that every spring when the snows began to melt, that there would be the um, image of a woman's body that would appear on the mountain face. And my dad called her the Indian princess, and he had this story that the nomadic Indians would look for her sign as a, look for her coming as a sign that spring had ended and that the, that the winter was over and it was time for them to come back. So it was a really beautiful place. The farm, I had owned a junkyard, which was full of crumpled up cars, and we played in it. It was a very exotic kind of playground. So there's, there's a lot of beauty in my childhood. I think it took me a long time to realize that there were, that, that it wasn't completely normal, because to me it seemed very normal. And then now I'm older, I can see there were elements of it that, that were probably unusual, you know. So my dad was opposed to a lot of the institutions that most people just take for granted. So public education, doctors and hospitals, anything to do with the government. And what that meant was that I was never allowed to go to school or to the doctor, and I, and I didn't have a birth certificate until I was nine years old. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's this kind of, it's a kind of interplay between this idyllic existence, right? You're running around kind of free in this environment that seems very foreign to me as a city kid. And it seems almost this magical place. But, and, I've, and I've heard you kind of talk about this, that it, there's, an other, there's the other side. And there, there were very much two sides to your childhood experience. Yeah, absolutely. So the mountain was beautiful. I would say everything that, that had one side to it had another. So my mother was an herbalist and a midwife. And so she, we would spend all these hours walking on the mountain, gathering mullein and, and Rose and rose hips that she could turn into tinctures. So there were all these beautiful things, but all of them had another side to it. So the uh, junkyard was this exotic playground, but we also got hurt in it quite a bit. Uh, there were a lot of injuries, like the time my, my brother lit his leg on fire, and it was covered in burns, and we made the decision to treat it at home because my father didn't believe in doctors or hospitals. So in a situation like that, 
even something like the herbalism, which was this wonderful thing that my mother was really talented at, could be a bit scary when you're dealing with a real injury that you know you don't have morphine or, or things like that. Could you speak a little bit about your father's philosophy? I mean, I, and I attribute it to your father more than your mother, though they did share in the philosophy, but it seems to me, reading the book, it, it came mostly from your father, is that fair to say? I think it was mostly coming from him. I mean, it's a complicated thing. Sometimes I think it was a, a kind of spiritual doctrine that he had, and sometimes I think it was, uh, he was, he had this theory that all these institutions, the government, public education, that they had been infiltrated by some kind of ill-meaning organization. Sometimes he called it the Illuminati or the New World Order or what have you. So I think his reason for opposing these things is because he believed that they were trying to do us harm. And he really believed it. I don't think he was, it was, you know, it was a real conviction that he had. There's a lot of fear there. I mean, do you have any, what is, if you could actually pinpoint what was he afraid of, really? from these Illuminati, from these different kind of sources. What, what was the fear? Where was the fear based? I think it depends on which institution you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think doctors, I think he was concerned that what he called the medical establishment, that they weren't actually doing good, that he believed that a lot of the things that people take, drugs, for example, any kind of pharmaceutical, would, would damage your body, you know, and that the effects would last for years, and also that they would damage you spiritually, and that you really you should you should use natural healing, you know, herbs. He called them God's pharmacy. So I think it, it was specific to each thing. I think with public education, he was worried that it was that it was brainwash, that you know it would kind of lead us away from God and that kind of thing. So it kind of depends on which, you know, he's a complicated person. Absolutely. Like everybody's complicated. I mean, it, you know, brainwashing seems to be. Um, big part of what he was talking about there, and he, a fear of, of you being brainwashed, of you know the Illuminati coming in and brainwashing. I, I think that's you know a, a part of it is is um, the fear of uh, I guess someone coming in and, and and changing the path that he has set for his children. I guess I mean it, is that part of the fear? Is this kind of outsider? I think so. Insider perspective. He had really specific ideas about things, and I think he was worried that we might go to a doctor and that we might kind of in some way compromise our health, our spirituality. I think he, you know, in his mind, the kind of, the path was, was narrow and you needed to, to do these exact right. things in order to stay in good standing with God, in order to do these, in order to, to be a good person and, and all these things. So I think, I think that was a fear that, that you could just easily get sucked into the world, you know, this, this, this idea of the world and the world being well, worldly, mm -hmm. and that being a bad thing. And I think a lot of people have that idea. Uh, I think it's a strong idea in a lot of religions. But for my father, it just included doctors. Right, right. I mean, it, it's, you, you are Mormon, but it's, it's not a, this is not it's a Mormon not perspective at all. representative of mainstream Mormonism at right. all. Yeah, most Mormons, almost all Mormons, you know, they, they support education. They either, most Mormons send their kids to school or they believe in homeschool, but they really believe in it. Or they're, you know, or and they definitely believe in doctors and things. So it's not representative of Mormonism at all. No, and I and I found that interesting in your preface that you said this is not. I mean, you, you wanted to make that point. I think I did because yeah. I think that right now the political environment is so polarized, and I think people will latch onto any story they can to confirm their own preconceptions about something. Mm -hmm. And I think that my dad had some irregular ideas. I think he had. I think that the way his his mind worked, and I, I'm not a medical professional, so I don't know what it was, but I, I felt like maybe he had some kind of mental irregularity. Um, and I just, in my mind, the religious extremism, I think, was a vehicle for that. So I would say whatever was happening in his mind, I think, caused the religious extremism. I don't think it was the other way around. And I don't want people to take this story and say, well, look, all religious people are like this, or all Mormons are like this, or we knew that there's these other people who are different from us, and it's really easy with people that are different from you to just make them into a caricature, and I didn't want that to happen. Well, let me tell you, from reading the book, that is not the takeaway at all. And, and I am, this is a foreign land to me, uh, you know, in, in many ways. Um, and that is not the takeaway at all, so I think you can rest assured that that's not going to be Excellent. a problem. Now, you know, you, you do talk, I mean, what, what is interesting to me is you know, the idea of kind of people taking from, you know, popular culture, what's going on in the news, and kind of applying it to their worldview. I mean, there's an example of that that you call 
your first memory that is not a memory, which is of the Ruby Ridge Massacre. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and that role in shaping kind of some of, some of the fear-based um, belief that, that your father kind of espoused to his children? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so he did have these ideas about the government and that the government, especially I think around the time of the Ruby Ridge incident, our family wasn't so different from the Weaver family in the way that we lived, in the kind of being a little bit isolated and, you know, we didn't go to school and all of that. So I think when that happened to them, my dad, there was a period where my dad was quite worried that it could happen to anyone, which isn't a completely irrational thing to take, I mean, if it's happened to someone else. But I was, I was about five when that happened, and so we kind of went into this period where we were canning a lot, and, and we were just, we were preparing. We got these bags that we were gonna, if we needed to run and hide in the mountain, we were gonna have them. I, I have a, you know, a, I, I, I had a journal entry from when, a few years later when I still had this bag and I documented all the contents. You know, it was pages of like, you know, a heater for the emergency food and water purifiers and mosquito nets and just all the things that you would need if you were going to go live on the mountain. And I had them in this bag. So for me, that, that event, I don't know how long it lasted for my dad. Maybe it was a, a blip, but it lived in my mind as this, as this very frightening thing that made me feel like the government could come at any moment. And he never told us the end of the story. Will you tell, this, will you tell a bit about the story? Just so yeah, so, I mean, the Weavers were this family, and they lived in Idaho, and they, the way that it began was, uh, I believe it had to do with a, a, a conflict over a rifle that Randy Weaver had sold, apparently to an undercover ATF agent at an Aryan Nations gathering. And he missed a court date, I think, and then they, the FBI and the federal marshals began to do some surveillance. And somehow there was a conflict where um, a dog was shot and then an agent was shot and then the, the son, Randy Weaver's, I think he was 11. And it just got out of hand very quickly, and it ended up being that Randy Weaver was shot when visiting his son's body. The agents had surrounded the cabin, and ultimately, Randy Weaver's wife, Vicky, was shot while holding their, their baby. She was killed by a sniper. So it was a horrendous story. And that was the version that I was told, that my, that my dad told us, is, look what could happen look what could happen to us. And I remember having, you know, dreams where I would, we would be crawling around on the floor because there were snipers outside. So it really lived in my mind in this way. But because he didn't really tell me the end of the story. So when I was 17, I was at university. And then I, I heard the end of the story. Uh, and I heard how there had been this massive public outcry. And there had been congressional inquiries, and newspaper, you know, every major newspaper had covered this story. And it became a, a different story. When I was a child, it had become a story about how frightening the government was and how they were going to come for us. And it was a secret thing that I thought only we knew about. I don't know how I thought we knew about it. But obviously then I realized, I mean, it was a terrible thing that happened. But there were checks on that. I mean, that's how a democracy works in right. a lot of ways. And it's, it wasn't something that was kept a secret. It wasn't covered up. It was, it was very much a public, you know, there's massive public outcry. So part of the fear of that story, I mean, as a five-year-old, that story is terrifying, you know, especially in the situation you were in where you were you very much identified with that family. But so you kind of feel that the idea that you, you weren't alone in that knowledge, that your family wasn't alone in that knowledge would have been comforting to you had you known that when you were that young, do you think? I think if I had just had an understanding of how the institutions themselves had responded, you know, that it wasn't like, the government wasn't this wholly evil force. Like, obviously, that was an incident of the abuses of power and a callous disregard for human life. I think one of the, I think that might be what the congressional report on it said. And I, I think that is a very different idea of government, that people, that there is a free press, that people find out about things, that there are checks and balances. I mean, when I went to university, I didn't just learn the end of the story of Ruby Ridge. I also learned how the Constitution works and what are the checks and balances on the system and what is the role of the free press. And that, you know, that changes the way that story felt quite a bit. That's really interesting to me. I, so I want to go back to what I like to think of is there are kind of three stages of your education in this book, and I'm assuming that's why you kind of call it educated. Um, and I, can you talk a little bit about the education that you learned with your family? And, and you know, it's not a traditional education, but no. what do you, not at all, but I mean, tell me some of the value of the things that you, you learned as, as a child there that, that most people in this country probably haven't, haven't learned. 
Well, so I, my parents believed in homeschool. And when my older brothers were younger, I think that my mother did a pretty a decent job of homeschooling. By the time I came along, she had seven kids. She was a midwife. She was an herbalist. There was a farm. Uh, there wasn't a lot of homeschool going on. So I never wrote an essay for my mother. I never took an exam. Um, there was never anything like a lecture, anything like that. So the homeschool that I received was pretty limited in terms of formal education. But there is one thing that I really valued from what my parents, just the way that they raised us. And they had this philosophy, and they would say it to us all the time, that you can teach yourself anything better than someone else can teach it to you. And I really, it's just a principle I really agree with. And I, I worry a lot that in when we talk about education in this country, and I live in England, all, I think there too, it's become something that is really passive. And there, there should be, an, uh, I think, an individual component to it and not just a social component. If, it, if it's just social, it is a bit propaganda. And I think people need to they need to feel actively engaged, I think, in designing their own curriculum. And I, I do think to some level we, I hate the word disempower, it sounds a bit cliche, but I do worry that a lot of people seem to have really taken to heart this idea that to learn something, you have to have a degree and you have to have a whole institution in place to teach it to you. And I'm, I'm grateful to my parents that I was not raised to think that. So when I decided I wanted to go to college when I was 16, it felt like something I could do, not because I had any formal education, but just, OK, I need to learn algebra. I will buy a book, and I'll learn it. And uh, I didn't do an amazing job. I kind of barely got into the university. But I kept going with that. And I think, yeah, my parents took it too far. I arrived at university really underprepared. And you know, I once raised my hand in a class and asked what the Holocaust was, because I'd never heard of it. And people thought I was being anti-Semitic. I think they thought I was denying it. I wasn't. I'd never heard of it before. So I wouldn't say this is the ideal education. I would not say that. But I do think they, I think they had something there about people feeling ownership over what they learn. Because if you think of education, I think a lot of people talk about education as a way to make money, as a way to get a better job. But the way I experienced it was it's about making a person. It's not about making money. It's about making a person. And I think everyone should have that opportunity to participate in the making of their own mind. And I just think it needs to be more active. And people need to be more involved, I think, in their own education. How did the way you were raised uh, help you write this book, do you think? <laughs> I mean, obviously, in a very literal <laughs> sense. But in terms of you know, the actual act of creating a book, it's not easy. Yeah, and I didn't know how to write narrative. I literally had not written a word of narrative when I decided to write this book. Wow. And I, I had a PhD, because I, once I got to school, I had really committed. And I, 10 years later, after I, you know, I set foot in a classroom the first time when I was 17. And 10 years later, I graduated from Cambridge with a PhD. So I knew how to do academic writing by then. It took me 10 years, but I figured it out. Uh, but I didn't know how to write prose, and it's really different. But I think it was that same principle. I sat down, thought, this is a skill I want, and what are the ways that I can get it? What are the ways I can learn? And the thing for me that made the biggest difference was the New Yorker Fiction podcast, which is amazing because you just have really great writers come on, and they read the stories of other great writers, and then they explain to you how they work. And it's an amazing curriculum. But more to the point, it was a curriculum that worked for me, and so I could pursue it. And I didn't have to spend a lot of time pursuing a curriculum that didn't work for me, because I think everybody is different, which is why I think the curriculum you make for yourself is always going to be better than what other people will make for you. Were there any, any books that were particularly helpful to you during the creation of this book? Well, when I started writing it, I'd never read a short story. And I found, I'd never heard of short stories. I didn't know what they were. But I found short stories so helpful. Um, there were a lot of books. I read a lot of Joan Didion. I read a lot of Slouching Towards Bethlehem and The Year of Magical Thinking. I read a lot of Toni Morrison because she's a genius. Um, and then a ton of short stories, you know, David Means. I just, yeah, I could go on and on. But there's so many great writers. But I think. You, you take the ones that speak to you, and there's some amazing writers that I enjoy reading, but they're nothing like I write, mm -hmm. and they don't give me ideas about how to write. And then there are some writers that, that do, and I think that's the beauty of having control over how you learn. So back to your childhood. Um, what were you reading then? I read a lot of, of religious books. We had other books in the house, but I didn't really read them. Mostly what I read, I read the Book of Mormon, I read the Bible, and I read a lot of 19th century speeches by 
the kind of founding Mormon prophets. So that was a, a language I was, I was at home in pretty quickly. It's pretty interesting when you went to school for the first time at 17 at BYU, you wrote in this kind of stilted, archaic style. Is that correct? Is, I did, yeah. yeah. I wrote in a very stilted style because that was, that was what I'd been reading. And I think a lot of my professors were just very bewildered by why I sounded like a, you know, 19th century. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It took a while to kind of get that, that voice out. Isn't it amazing that the writing voice is, is often so different than the talking voice and that you had to really work on, you didn't speak in that way, you didn't speak in that stilted way, I'm assuming. Um, isn't that interesting that that was the part that you really had to kind of I think a lot of people have this yeah. with writing, where they, uh, they feel um, a certain self-consciousness about writing. And I think sometimes when we feel self-conscious, we become more formal. Yes. And I've noticed this in a lot of writing, not just my own, that people will use words like establishment instead of building or, or store. You know, words that you would never, you'd never use because I think they feel like they sound more... Um, <laughs> somewhere intellectual or something. Yeah. So I had that, but I just had a really bad case of it because of all the 19th century books I'd read. How long did it take you to get that kind of exercise that? Well, I wrote the whole book, the first draft, in about a year. And I would say the first four months, everything I wrote was absolutely terrible. So about four months. Are you being hard on yourself or was it real? No, it was actually... I'm not particularly <laughs> afflicted with false modesty. Like, it was really bad. It was... <laughs> Really bad. I took it to a writing group once, and yeah, they were. I mean, and I was lucky because I didn't really think of myself as a writer. I was literally trying to learn to write because I wanted to write this one book, and so I didn't have it. It wasn't a part of my identity. When they said this is really terrible, I was said, "Yeah, I know. <laughs> of course it is. I'm not a writer." And just tell me how to make it better. And so that was actually a really wonderful place from which to learn how to write because I had no personal feelings about it at all. So the ego was not. Oh, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't think I was a writer. I didn't. There's no reason I should know how to do this. I've, ne I've literally never written a word of story before, but I'm going to try to learn. And so it was, yeah, it was a really great place. What's interesting to me is that you journaled for a good portion of your life. When did you start journaling? And, and talk a little bit about those journals that you have. I have a couple of journal entries from when I was eight, but I really get serious about it when I was about 10. And then I was very faithful about it. And, and I have all of them. You know, a whole stack, two, two or three stacks. What do they look like? Are they all different kinds, or do they're you have really, a certain? <laughs> they're really different. They're all very. A lot of them were given to me by my grandmother, and they tend to be. Um, yeah, they tend to have a picture of, of Jesus on them. Actually, almost all of them, I would say, up to the age of sixteen, and then they just become black. <laughs> was there, what was the act of, for you? Uh, I know I, I'm a journaler as well. Um, and what, for me, it, it, it's about. Kind of, I don't think I really understand something until I write it down. Mm. What, was the, what was your act of, of writing? Why were you doing it? Do you, do you have an idea of why? I think that there were a couple of reasons. I think, I think there was a bit of loneliness there. I, sometimes when I read those entries, I detect... I mean, I didn't have a lot of friends. I didn't have any friends, actually. There was another family that lived in my town who were like my family, and their kids didn't go to school, and they didn't believe in doctors. And so I would occasionally see this one other girl. But all the kids in our town... I never went to any of their houses. I was never invited. Oh, so I was pretty isolated. I think I, I, I had my siblings, but, but you know, I think I wanted friends. Yeah. And so I think I would write in this journal so I could tell someone all my stuff. And I think that was one reason. So I think there was probably a processing element to it. And I don't know. It, I don't know. Other than that, I don't really know why I did it. But I, I really latched onto it. I imagine you're grateful for them now, having written this book. It, they were probably indispensable. They were really, really yeah. helpful. Yeah. Um, they were. Yeah. Do you still journal now? I do, yeah. yeah. You know, who knows what's next, right? <laughs> but um, so, I'm, you know, what's interesting to me, again, going back to your childhood was, for me, a big part of something I did not recognize in my own, and there are many things, but was, was the pain, like physical pain, threats of physical pain. That, I mean, in childhood, we skim our knee and we hurt ourselves. But, I mean, you were in a junkyard, you know, there's a, there's a part where you have this accident in the junkyard. Would you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so my dad ran a junkyard. Um, and he, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, he just didn't have that bone in his head that would tell him, this is a dangerous thing, do not do this thing. And then even after someone had been hurt, he didn't always understand how serious it was. And I think he kind of thought that everything that happened happened for the best and that we were going to be protected. So he didn't really believe in safety equipment in 
in the traditional sense, you know, we would build these big buildings, we'd be standing on beams, and we didn't have safety harnesses, we didn't wear safety hats. It, we, we just it was a very dangerous place. And I don't think it's because he didn't care about our safety. I think he did care about our safety. I just don't think he understood how dangerous it was, and then even after it would happen. And there was one example of that when I was um, probably around 14. My, we were just, I was filling up a, a bin full of scrap metal, and then when the bin was full, the idea was it had to be picked up by a forklift uh, and a JCB, which is a forklift with an extendable boom. And then it had to be taken over and dumped into the semi-trailer, this massive trailer. And so I filled up this bin, and I said to my dad, okay, let's dump the bin. And he, he wanted someone to go into the, the big bin, the trailer, and settle the scrap after he dumped it. But he decided that it would be faster if I rode up in the bin of scrap. And then he said, I'll hold it level with the trailer, and you can kind of crawl out and then skimmy over to the cab where you'll be out of the way of the falling metal, and, uh, and everything will be great. And I was terrified. I was not in the habit of disobeying my dad, so I got in the bin. And when he was, he picked up the bin, and as he was turning to, to rotate around to where the trailer was, a bit of a bit of scrap just came loose, and it had a really jagged edge, and it just pierced through my leg like like a knife going into butter, and it just pinned me in place, and I couldn't move. So he he had the bin; it was level. He was waiting for me to crawl out. I was trying to shout down to him that I couldn't move. But it was a really loud diesel engine, and he couldn't hear me. And so then he starts raising it up, and I know he is going to dump this bin, and I'm inside it, and it's going to be like going through a meat grinder. I mean, 2,000 pounds of falling scrap metal. Uh, luckily, when the scrap started to fall, the thing came out of my leg, and it fell, and I was able to throw myself over the side. So I fell to the ground, and I, I hit the side of the trailer, but I was, I was injured, but I was okay. And... I just remember at the time feeling really, I think I first experienced anger that he'd let it happen, but that dissipated really quickly. And after that, I just felt kind of ashamed. It seemed like a, it seemed like a simple thing, and I didn't know why I hadn't been able to do it. And I think what I was missing in that moment, I, I knew that my dad would never hurt me on purpose. I didn't have that information that, that there might be something going on in his head where he could, you know, value my safety but not be able to keep me safe. You know, that there might be an explanation besides this is my fault because I knew he would never hurt me and yet somehow I'd gotten hurt, so it had to be me. And I think as children we experience events in this way and, and it's so easy to internalize it and internalize guilt. And I had to be much older, I think, before I could look back on that event and not feel ashamed about it. And then I think there was a period where I was just really angry at my father. How could you have this happen to me? How could you have been this kind of father? And then I think now where I'm at is I feel like I feel like now I have all the pieces and I can put it together and say, he would never have wanted to let me get hurt. However, for whatever reason, he isn't able he wasn't able to, to run the scrap yet any other way. He wasn't able to understand the risks of the way he was doing things. You know, I, I'm just blown away by your the fact that you're not angry. I mean, you know, so many people are angry at their parents, you know, and for sometimes minor, you know, transgressions, you know. But this is a pretty major one, and you seem to not really hold any anger uh, well, towards I, him. I have a theory about anger. I think anger is important. I think it's a mechanism that the brain uses to keep us from going back to situations or people that will harm us. But I think, I think there's a risk with anger as well, because if you... If it takes over too much of your life, I think it can be really consuming. And, I mean, spoiler alert, I, I am estranged from my parents. And that circumstance was, was really hard. The really hard things that happened that led to that outcome. And for a long time after that happened, I was full of rage. Every beautiful memory I had from my childhood was completely, it just turned to rot. And I became a person who had no beautiful memories, whose whole life was rage. And I just think, I think you need anger maybe to get you out of these situations. But then once you're out, once you're safe, I'm not sure you do need it. And I kind of wonder if you can just get rid of it and live a better life without it. I think if I still had my, my family in my life, I would need my anger. I would need it every day. But, but now I, I don't feel like I need it particularly. And it's been important for me to reclaim 
the beautiful parts of my childhood. So to remember that, yes, the scrapyard was, was frightening, but it was also fun. And yes, my father let those things happen to me, but he would never have wanted that to happen. And there were wonderful things about him, too. And so I think it's a delicate balance because I would never want to take the good things about them and say, oh, I'm just going to only focus on the good and dismiss the bad things because you'll let yourself get hurt or you'll let someone else get hurt. But then you, so you don't want to obsess over the bad either. So I aspire to this idea of, of kind of mental integrity, which just means that, to me anyway, it means that no one can take from me the good, but no one can obscure from me the bad. And that's what I mean when I say I just want to live in my own head. And I, don't, I, I want to have a, a grasp on, on the reality as it is. And I don't want to get consumed with, with anger that blocks out the wonderful things about a person. But I also don't want to expose myself to risks by not recognizing their limitations. This sounds extremely evolved. And um, <laughs> are you in therapy? Or have you come to this on your I've own? I've done a lot of therapy. I think, I think I had to come to a lot of it on my own. But I, I have done a lot of therapy. But I think it's something... I think therapy is really helpful because it never feels like it is. That's the tragedy of it. It never feels helpful. But I do think it is because you set aside this time to think about how you feel and do you want to feel that way. And I have spent a lot of time in therapy thinking about how angry I feel and realizing I, I don't want to feel that way. But I also don't want to go back. So what's, what's the middle road? Right. Right. Was this book an act of, was it catharsis or did it bring a lot of these things back? It ended up being cathartic. I didn't think it would be. I thought, oh, I'm sorted. <laughs> but um, it was, I think, because, for one thing, the bits of it that I thought would be hard to write about, which were the kind of more traumatic bits, were actually not very hard to write about. I feel like I had, before I started writing, I'd really reconciled with the bad things in my life. The danger of the scrapyard. I had a violent older brother. I felt like I'd kind of reconciled with that. What I hadn't reconciled yet were the beautiful things. So the way the mountain looked, the way that my mother would laugh when she was canning peaches, the, the good things about my father, and the good things even about my older brother. I think those were the things that I had loved about my childhood the most. And those were the things that I had lost. And it was, it was hard, actually. That was the hard thing, was being really close to these things that I was never going to have again. And I think that ended up being the hardest Thing to write about, but I think in a way a good thing because it let me reclaim a bit of that in a, in a strange way. I'll never really be able to reclaim it, but I've reclaimed it in this other way. Is there one part of the book that was particularly hard to write that surprised you? There were a couple moments about my dad that were hard to write about. There was a moment where my brother saves my life, basically. We're breaking in horses, and I was on a horse that went completely berserk, and he was on a horse that had never had a rider on it before. It had never been ridden. It was its first time. And my horse went into a fit, and I got my foot caught in the saddle. And it was bucking, and it was running, and it was, it was on a hillside, and there were ravines everywhere. It was really just a matter of time before I fell off and was dragged. And that's pretty much game over. Your head hits on a rock, and it's done. And my brother somehow, on this completely unbroken horse, managed to catch hold of my horse and, and slow it down. And this is the brother who was quite violent, who was very manipulative, who was very controlling, who would at other times twist my wrist behind my back and call me a whore. But he had this, this wonderful side. And I think what took me a long time, as I kind of said before, is you can't, for me, it was always tempting to say he is kind. He can be sensitive. He can be really wonderful. And I, I still think that. But I don't want to use those things to dismiss the fact that he could be Manipulative, cruel, even even violent. Yeah, I wanted to talk about Sean, and, and I was wondering if that was hard for you to talk about, but it seems you're pretty open. I feel in like talking that's the it. thing that I've kind of reconciled with the yeah. most, kind of in I mean, a weird me, way. For me, reading it, it was. I mean, there are po points where I had to put down the book because it, it's it's really hard to read. It's hmm. very violent, and also uh, like psychologically violent as well. So it's not just the physical violence. He. he it was a psychological torture in, in some ways with him. I found the psychological, I think people fix it on the physical, and I actually tried not to dwell on the physical very much because to me it was not the important mm -hmm. part. I have a, this idea that I think all abuse, no matter what kind of abuse it is, I think it's foremost an assault on the mind. Because if you're going to abuse someone, I think you have to invade their reality in order to distort it, and you have to convince them of two things. You have to convince them that what you're doing isn't that bad, which means you have to normalize it, you have to justify it, rationalize it. And the other thing you have to convince them of is that they deserve it. And the second thing I think is actually pretty easy to convince people of because people tend to internalize that kind of guilt when they're hurting. But the first thing 
The first thing is hard, and my, my brother was, was pretty good at it. He could, in a matter of minutes, convince me that something had not happened, that, that had happened you know, two minutes before, and he could just convince me to have a completely different interpretation of it. And one example of that, I, when I was 17, I brought this, this young man home, his name was Charlie, uh, for Thanksgiving dinner. And I think my brother, I think he just felt some need to demonstrate this control over me in front of this, this person. And so before the meal had even started, he grabbed me by my hair and he hauled me down the hallway and he shoved my head in the toilet. And later, when it was all over, he, he told me that it had just been a game and that, you know, next time we were having fun, I should really be, be sure to tell him if, 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 I, if, if I was in any pain. Because he said, I had no idea. I thought you were having a really good time. And I completely took that perspective on board, 100%. So much so that I actually tried to convince Charlie of it. And he knew what he had seen. But he also, I think, knew that reality had no, had no bearing on me. He could see that how far under, how much under my brother's power I was. And he tried to reason with me for a while and then, and then didn't and could just see... You know, but then there was another incident a couple months later, and I'd, I'd been at university for a while, and I think going to university really helped me learn how to hold on to my own ideas, my own opinions, and it gave me the ability to say I disagree with something. And a few months later, um, it happened again, and uh, my brother attacked me in a parking lot. And then that evening, when it was all over, he came into my room and he said, oh, I'm really sorry, we were just having a good time, and I had no idea that I'd even hurt you. So next time we're having fun, make sure you speak up if, if, you're, if you're in any pain. And after he left, I was writing in my journal, and I wrote that I didn't know which version to believe. But I wrote down my version. I wrote that I'd been terrified. I wrote that I'd been in pain. Um, I wrote that in that moment, if I'd been able, I would have torn him apart. And so I had these two versions in my mind, and I didn't in that moment necessarily say, well, mine's right and his is wrong. I didn't know if he'd experienced it as a game, but I knew I had not experienced it as a game. And I think that was an important moment because it was the first time, I think, that I didn't immediately cede my reality to someone else's. And I think it was the first time that my brother attempted to dominate me, and at the end of that process, there were still two minds present, two distinct minds, not one mind having gained control over another. That's really, I mean, you know, it's almost like a testament. Like you're putting this down as this is your experience. And there were times before in your journal from, but that you include in your book where you're still engaging in what you call reality bending, right? Mm. You know, and you say things like, Sean, um, I w he was so much nicer to me before the accident. He had an accident. And you said yeah. something to the effect of, well, he was my best friend before and he was so wonderful to me before and now he's mean. And then you go back and you realize, no, he was, he was violent and, and, and abusive before the accident, and it was almost as if you were playing this game with yourself. Well, I had, to, I had to, I had revised in my mind, he had a really serious head injury. He fell when he was working for my father, he fell off a pallet, and he was a really serious head injury. He nearly died, and I had revised when that accident took place, because we were, we expected he might be violent after that accident, but I had just somehow in my mind told myself that it happened when I was very young and that that explained everything. And it was actually when I was writing the book, I got my own journal and I, I talked to my brothers who also kept journals and said, you know, if I got the date on this wrong, how is this possible? And it had turned out that it happened when I was much older, uh, I think when I was 17. And that was 16, I think I was 16. And that was just, like, I, I suddenly thought that doesn't explain any of it then because it had been going on for so much longer than that. And that was hard. I mean, even that night that things happened with, with Charlie when he was there that day with Thanksgiving, I mean, I have emails I wrote to him that night saying he would never hurt me. And not, 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 not after the head injury or before the head injury, but, you know, he would never, he would never hurt me. And I was writing this. I had a broken toe. And my, my wrist was in a sling. Like, and I was saying, oh, that he would never do this thing that he'd obviously done. So I think... I think it's hard to underestimate how powerful that, that reality distortion is. And I think it's not just the person who's experiencing it. I think anyone who's living in proximity to these kinds of relationships is to some degree subject to the reality bending that goes on to justify it. You can actually say enabling that reality bending in, in a way. Enabling. I want to get back to that. But I do want to talk about memory. This leads nicely into the kind of questions that you, you kind of flirt with in the text about memory. And putting this book together, it seems like it involved 
interviewing with a lot of people and putting to, putting together a lot of different sources and trying to kind of ferret out the truth, right? What what really happened? What are your thoughts on that? And and what are your thoughts on the reliability of your own memory now, having done all this? I think it's it's a difficult thing because you don't want to overly rely on your memory, but you don't want to be vulnerable to people coming in and. You know, my family culture had a culture of justifying, rationalizing. There was a lot of that term gaslighting, denying things that were happening kind of almost as they were happening. And I think we were all so affected by it, so deeply affected by it, that it, it could become really difficult to sort out. But luckily, you know, there were, my, you know, my brothers were really wonderful. They were really helpful. And then there, it's nice. In-laws are a wonderful thing because they come in from the outside and they see things through different eyes and they're a lot less vulnerable I think to some of those distortions that that happen so I think I think memory is complicated and I think sometimes the stories that spring up in families that that maybe they're right maybe they're wrong but I think sometimes those narratives themselves can tell you quite a bit oh yeah I mean I think it's so interesting I mean how much do you think now you touch on this as well I mean you know explicitly actually you talk about your father's mental health, and though you know you are not a psychiatrist, not, yeah. however, you know there are things in the in, in that you experienced firsthand that would lead one to believe that there was an instability there. And there's a a moment when you're in a psych 101 class at BYU, and you hear about bipolar disorder, and this kind of turns a light on in your mind, and you think this sounds like my father. I think it was. My whole idea of mental illness before I took that class, I thought you just had to be raving a lunatic. Mm -hmm. You know, you wear fruit on your head and fall in love with cat, and that was my idea of it. So what that class did is it gave me another category, another way to think about mental health and mm -hmm. the brain. And I, I'm not a medical professional. I have no idea. But I do feel like there's a gap between the fact that my father loves me and yet we could be so terribly hurt by the things that he did, you know, physically especially. There was just, there was some irrational decisions he made about how to do things. And I know that it wasn't malicious. So having that other category helped me. It helped me understand that sometimes people do the best they can. And that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean everything's okay. Yeah, does, does that, having that label, does it provide some kind of comfort that you think, again, it could, it seems as if, at least when you were a child, you were kind of subsuming some of that, like some of that shame you were, you were kind of focusing on yourself. I'm the one who, of course. who was, you know, when you describe yeah. that experience in the junkyard, you are the one who was wrong, not your father. Does hearing this kind of outside label or perspective from the mental health kind of pers perspective on this, does it that helped. help? It helped so much because yeah. it helped me go back and re-experience that and have empathy for my dad. Also for myself, it's a very hard thing to have empathy yeah. for yourself, especially you know your younger child self to kind of think, I'm sorry that happened to you. That shouldn't have happened to you. Yeah. And but I think it's a really important step of healing to let yourself off the hook for those kind of feelings that you've been carrying around. Is this this might be a cheesy question, but I have to ask it. If you could talk to yourself when you were ten, is there something you would say in particular to yourself? You know? No, oh, I don't know. I kind of think. And this is going to be cynical. Sorry to be cynical to your, <laughs> to your like heartfelt question. <laughs> I don't think there's anything anyone could have said to me that would have made any difference. I mean, one of the things Charles said to me that night with my brother, when I was telling him, um, it wasn't that night. It was a little bit later. We ended up breaking up because I was just too dysfunctional, basically, to be in a relationship. And one of the things he said to me. Um, he basically said, I can't, you know, he was 17, I'm just a kid in high school, I can't, this is out of my league, this is way over my head. And he said to me, I can't change this for you. You can, you're the only one that can make this better. And I think that's true. I don't think there's anything that I could say or anybody else could say to my 10-year-old self that would move, move the needle at all. I think it was something I had to come to terms with. And I think that's true of the eventual estrangement from my family, which was an incredibly difficult decision. And there were a lot of years that I was searching every story, every film, every novel for permission to make the decision I'd made, the permission to cut my father out of my life. And eventually I kind of realized no one is going to give you that permission. You have to give it to yourself. Now, the, the one thing that did change your path, it sounds like, is your brother Tyler, um, and, and several times. Um, but the first time is when he introduces you to music and also when he 
kind of shows that college is a possibility. It probably wasn't even in your idea of the future. I mean, what was your idea of the future prior to, to you know, Tyler going off to college? What did you think? Well, my parents, especially my dad, had the strong belief that a woman's place is in the home. So you get, I always thought I would get married when I was 17 or 18, maybe 19. And, you know, put a house on the farm, have kids. That was kind of you know, homeschool them, maybe probably be a midwife like my mother, work in the herbs. That was very much how I thought my life would go until I was 16 and my older brother Tyler, who had educated himself and got himself into university, came home and said, I think that you should try to do this. Yeah, I mean, some of the most incredible parts of the book are when you go to BYU for the first time and you're outside of your family, really, for the first time uh, and on your own for the first time and and of existing as an adult when you've never stepped in foot into a classroom before. Can you talk a little bit about those, those early days and, and what that must have been like? I mean, what, what did you look like then and, and how did you act? I mean, can you kind of describe that for me? Probably acted quite strangely. <laughs> um, I, I definitely acted, you know, I, I didn't feel like I belonged to my family really quickly, but I also didn't belong there either. I'd never spent any time with what I would have called public school kids, you know, kids who went to the public school. I'd never been friends with mainstream Mormons, I, you know. And so for me, they lived in this way that I thought was quite licentious, even though they were very observant Mormons, because they drank Coke or the women would occasionally wear like a tank top around the flat, around the apartment and things like that that I just was appalled by. So I didn't really necessarily enter into a fellowship immediately with people because I was a bit weird. I didn't have the greatest hygiene. My housemates had to sit me down and kind of say, well, most people wash their hands after they go to the bathroom. And that was something my dad had always taught us. Like my grandmother, my mother's mother used to get after him for this because we never did. And then and he would always say to her, oh, no, I don't, I don't teach my kids to wash their hands after they go to the bathroom. I teach them not to piss on their hands. And I thought that was a great philosophy, which my house, my, you know, my new roommates did not think that was a great philosophy. So no, I didn't, I didn't fit in. I felt very outside. And I had a hard time, even once I started to fit in a little better. I made a few friends and I was doing okay in school. It was really hard, but I was, I was going to, I was, I was making it. Then I was even more confused because in a way then I would go back to Idaho and I would, I would have all my mainstream friends and, and it would seem more normal to go to the doctor even though I never had. But all these things are becoming more normal. But then I would go back to Idaho and I would watch the way my family lived. And it, it would feel completely foreign and at the same time utterly like familiar. Mm -hmm. And you know when my dad, he, um, he gets really injured my, my, my third year where he's standing next to a car trying to take a fuel tank off. And rather than, than taking it off in the other way, he does it with a cutting torch. And a spark from the torch makes it into the fuel tank, which he hasn't drained, and the car explodes. And he was burned horribly. I mean, his whole upper half of his body, just so many third degree burns. And my family made the decision to treat it at home. And I remember, you know, they used the salve that my mother had of comfrey and lobelia, and they had no morphine, and he almost died. There was a part, there was a moment where I thought he had died, and I kind of closed my eyes and started praying and trying to say goodbye and said I was sorry that our relationship had been so full of conflict. But he didn't die. But even though he didn't die, there were months, it was months of this healing process, and there was so much pain. And the whole time, I was at war with myself. I didn't know whether I thought they were right and this is what God wanted them to do or whether they were insane and they were torturing him for no reason. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge step that you experience when you, when you go away and you kind of see a different perspective. Do you remember in school, I mean, you talk about learning about the Holocaust and, and not knowing about the Holocaust and how everyone was kind of shocked about that and probably didn't even believe that you didn't know about it. Were there other examples that you can remember of things that you know, looking back, you're kind of embarrassed that you didn't know then, or? Oh, so many things. You know, all those kind of stories where someone's talking about Queen and you think they're talking about the Queen. And right. Just so there's a, every, I would say 80% of what people said to me casually about anything with pop culture, I would just, oh yeah, right. Were you like, an, like almost like an alien life form, like yeah, coming I in? Yeah, I didn't know what they were saying. There's and a I learned, language I learned that you really, don't, yeah. yeah. Smile and nod, exactly. Yeah. I did a lot of smiling and nodding. In, in terms of, I mean, school though, I'd never heard of the Civil Rights Movement, and that was, I'd heard of slavery, but I'd, I definitely learned it from a very different perspective, I think, than 
you know, reading accounts of slavery from slaves, like Frederick Douglass, was really eye-opening for me because I had never had that perspective of it. But it was really the civil rights movement. That really blew my mind that that had happened and that it was so recent. And I realized that, you know, my mother had been a child when this was happening, and it wasn't so far in the past. You know, that time could be measured. It could be measured in the wrinkles on my mother's skin. You know, it wasn't measured in geological time. It was really, really recent. And that, that, did, that did really blow my mind. Now you end up going to Cambridge. Uh, actually, we go Trinity first. We'll go Trinity first. Um, did you have an experience of, of imposter syndrome late when, you were, when you were there? I mean, it sounds like a little bit how, what you're describing. You know, you're, you're kind of a professor kind of cho- chooses you in, as a person who he feels has a lot of potential. Yeah, he really helped me. There was a study abroad program that went to Cambridge, and he, uh, I applied because he told me I should, and then I didn't get in. <laughs> and he wrote them and said, I think this person is learning a lot. She's really behind, but I, I really think she'll catch up, and we should give her a chance. And they, and they did. So I owe, I owe him a lot for that. I mean, what, have you talked to him about that and what he saw in you? No. Yeah, you never asked him. Can you imagine him? a comfortable way? Yeah, like, how did you see in which me? Which of my amazing qualities <laughs> I'm so amazing. did you perceive? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I have never asked. You didn't, you didn't no. do that interview for the book? Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, I wrote him what I, I sent him what I'd written and said, what do you think? But no, I didn't, I didn't ask. I, I have no idea. But while abroad that first time, in the beginning, you describe a little bit of imposter syndrome, like, I don't belong here. You know, these people are different, you know. But there seems to be, there's this turning point where, I think it is at Trinity, where you start hearing about positive liberty and you're reading about all these different ideas. And Mm. at some point, you kind of write in the book, you're like, I belong. Did that happen there? I mean, did you really feel that? I think I still probably felt like I didn't belong at that moment. But I was really interested in the ideas I was learning. Um, I was really interested in... Yeah, it was hard not to be excited by what I was learning because it was so interesting. And then I was going through a lot of changes. So when I learned, I went to this lecture on positive liberty, I think it was my first week when I came to Cambridge as an actual Cambridge student. So the study abroad program, and then I applied, and I got in as a real, you know, I ostensibly belong here. And um, I think my first week I went to this lecture. And that lecture really blew my mind because... The whole point of Isaiah Berlin's negative and positive liberty is this idea that, yes, there are external obstacles that people have that keep them from doing things. If you're tied up, you can't do something. But positive liberty says that there are obstacles that that people have to them doing things that are internal, that exist only in the mind. So if you're tied up, you may not be able to go outside. But also, if you believe that someone outside is going to shoot you, and there isn't someone like that. It doesn't matter whether they're there or not, you still can't go outside. And so this idea that what might be the most important thing in determining how much freedom you have and ability you have, that that might be in your own mind, that had never occurred to me. And it was around this time that a friend of mine sent me this song by someone, of course, I'd never heard of, because I'd never heard of anyone. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's by Bob Marley. (laughs) And I got really obsessed with that lyric Emancipate yourselves. Free from, yourself from mental slavery. Right? Yeah, emancipate yeah. yourself emancipate from, men, from yes. mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. And I became really obsessed with that. And then I ended up on Wikipedia reading about Bob Marley, and I read about the cancer that he'd had on his toe and how these doctors oh, yes. had told him that he needed to amputate the toe. But he had a Rastafarian belief in a whole body, so he didn't. And what happened was he died, yeah. and he was young. And when I was reading that, I... I realized that I had stopped believing in my dad's view of doctors and hospitals. I, at least I told myself I had, but I'd never had my vaccinations. And, it, and I called, and I, and I got them. I got all of them. I left the, I left the hospital looking like a pincushion because <laughs> I had them all in one day, and it took me quite a long time to convince the nurse that I really did need all of them. Uh, but it was, yeah, it was a moment where I kind of realized, yeah, I have renounced that old world view the old view of the world, but I haven't quite found the courage to live in this new one. But there is a moment when you do find that courage, um, and that that happens after you and Sean. I mean, he effectively, you guys are complete, completely kind of banishes you from the family, and, and you know. Well, I confronted my parents about my my sister and I both experienced something with my brother, and she told me that I should confront my parents, and I I decided I would. Uh, so I, I did. I, I told them that I, I thought it was an issue. I thought we needed to deal with it. 
And my father decided that I was lying, and he said I was trying to destroy the family. My mother said maybe I was crazy, that my memories couldn't be trusted, and that was hard. Having them not believe me was really hard. But I think the hardest thing really was after that, they called my brother, and they told him everything I'd said. And what followed after that was a period of a lot of threats, and he would, you know, he called me and said he'd hired an assassin to come kill me, these kinds of things, and... Then he cut me out of his life. He disowned me, and my parents supported that decision. And so that Christmas, they said, you're not allowed to come home because it will make your brother uncomfortable. For the reader, I was most upset by your mother in that situation. I, I felt that there was an opportunity there when you went and kind of approached your mother about these things, and, and she seemed to be of equal mind. She, she had seen the things that you... She agreed with me at yeah. first. We had a chat, actually. It was online. Um, when, she, when I first started talking to her about it, and, and we had this chat where she said, yeah, I, 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 I can see this now. I, of course, this has been happening, and we're going to help you, and we're going to take care of it, and we're going to get him into therapy, and we're going to, it's going to be okay. And, and she apologized to me. She said that she was sorry that she hadn't been able to keep us safe. But when my father took the position he did, uh, she, she followed suit. This all culminates um, with a blessing that your father offers you when you're at Harvard, and you, you decline that blessing. Um, can you, unfortunately, we do not have a lot, have a lot of time. I have, I have a million questions for you, but no, will, right. will, you, will, you, will you talk to me a little bit about, about that? Because that, that yeah. to me, I mean, that's, that's where your kind of education yeah. comes full circle in a well, way. Well, the first stage of the estrangement I had from my parents was not by my choice. My brother cut me out of his life, and my parents supported it, and I was ostracized for ten, about 10 months. And then my, I was doing a fellowship at Harvard, and my father came to visit me with my mother, which was surprising because my dad hates traveling and he really hates liberals. So Harvard was not, <laughs> like not, not an ideal place for him. But he came and he'd only been there with, with an my NRA mother. cap as well, right? Yes. Yeah, he yeah. came and he, he did not fit in. But he came and they'd only been there a few days before I realized that they had come to offer me a way back into the family. And what that looked like was they had been telling people and they believed that I was possessed. No, that's why I had said these things I had said about my brother. And so they were going to kind of offer me this blessing as a kind of exorcism. And if I could just go along with it, I could say that I hadn't meant any of the things I said. I could recant effectively, kind of trade out their memories for mine, and then I could have my family. And there was a period of a couple days at Harvard when we were sightseeing around Boston, pretending like we were a happy family, when I kind of thought I could make that bargain. I thought it, I thought it was a pretty good deal. And I was arguing with myself, I was trying to convince myself that there was maybe some dignity in denying my own memories in, and my own perceptions, and that, there was, that I was maybe justified somehow in surrendering what I knew to be true. And I really, yeah, I really thought it was a deal that I could make. But the night before they left back to Idaho, my dad offered me this blessing, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it. And I think, I think that there were a couple things I realized in that moment first thing I realized is that the, the daughter that my father had come to reclaim, she just didn't exist anymore. I had gone off and I had gained whole different perspectives. I had a whole different mind from all the studying I'd done. And that, that mind I had had no tolerance for violence. I couldn't, I couldn't surrender to it. And it was really clear to me, of course I had been the one that said, it wasn't a demon that said those things about my brother, it was me. And that what my father had come to cast out of me, it wasn't a demon, it was, it was me. I want to end this um, with a final reading um, at the end of the book that I think brings us all f full circle and brings it back to kind of the education that you were able to achieve through this experience. So, Just give me one second. Of course. I thought I dog-eared it, <laughs> but naturally I didn't. No matter how much I appeared to have changed, how illustrious my education, how altered my appearance, I was still her. At best, I was two people, a fractured mind. She was inside and emerged whenever I crossed the threshold of my father's house. That night, I called on her and she didn't answer. She left me. She stayed in the mirror. The decisions I made after that moment were not the ones she would have made. They were the choices of a changed person, a new self. You could call this selfhood many things transformation, metamorphosis, falsity, betrayal. I call it an education. Thank you so much, Tara. My pleasure. Thank you for writing this exceptional book. Thank you.
Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards. Please rate and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts.